Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, meaning Jesus. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, uh, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, there's a quote I want to share with you. It's from Gandhi, of all people, but he said this, and there's different variations of this quote, but here's the one that, uh, that I chose to share with you. He says this, I like your Christ, because he was a, a Hindu. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now, of course, you could completely disregard Gandhi's critique based solely on the fact that he was not a Christian himself, and therefore his opinion is basically invalid. You know, what do we care what an unbeliever has to say about us? The problem with that is that Scripture itself kind of alludes to something very similar. Here's a couple of texts that prove the point. James chapter 1, verse 22. It reminds us, it compels us, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I don't know about you, but this is something that I wrestle with quite a bit. I read the Bible. I've heard heard it preached. um, We talk about it quite often. And so I know it. Do I always conform to it, obey it? No. And then here in 1 John 2, 5 and 6, notice what it says there. But those who obey God's word really do love him. Love is always the, the motivational factor. Like, why do I obey God? Well, it's because I want to go to heaven, because I want him to answer this prayer. This is often our kind of uh, deal with God. I'm going to obey you when in the long term you'll bless me with an eternity in your presence in the meantime you'll give me what i want and that's our motivating factor and that's never what we find in scripture it's this but those who obey god's word really do love him we do it because he first loved us and we want to show our love for him and then it goes on that is the way to know whether or not we live in him those who say they live in God should live their lives as Christ did. There should be something different. There should be a transformation in the way that we follow Christ. In other words, if you have indeed repented of your sins, trusted in Christ alone for your salvation, well then, this should be confirmed by the way you follow him, the way you live your life. Your life over time should become more like Christ's more loving, more trusting, more faithful, more forgiving, all of, more sacrificial, sacrificial, more unconditional love, all these attributes and characteristics that we see as we study and look at the life of Christ and who he is, that should be more evident in our life over time, not instantaneously, but over time. So then what does it mean to actually follow Christ? Is it just a matter of believing the right things? Is it about your behavior, a list of morals, do's and don'ts? Here's the struggle. Again, if you're like me, you, you never feel that you've arrived, right? That you've been fully accepted. It's almost as if, you know, you hang out at church and you're always on the outside looking in, as though the grass is greener on the other side. Life is better with those people that seem to sing louder and with more joy, and they talk about prayer life, and they talk about their children coming to faith, and you're going, yeah, (laughs) sure, whatever, you know. Don't engage because then the truth might come out about who you are. You always feel like, I'm want to be there, but I'm not there yet. I'm not following Christ the way you are. And it, it always seems like you're the odd man out. This is the way I feel quite often. Even as a pastor, I hope you know that. Pastors are no different. And so if you're like me, you never feel like you've quite arrived. I don't know enough about the Bible, its truths. I don't know what I don't do, rather, what is commanded of me all the time. The things that I do get out of Scripture, I don't always follow to the T. I do plenty of sinning. I feel very inadequate. 
a poor and sinful example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. If this is you, and I'm sure it's many of us, if not all of us, please know this. You are not alone. You are not without hope. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. You, You get that? Because look, this is where we often find hope, and it's very limited. Like, okay, I woke up this morning, I read my Bible, and I prayed. These are all good things. We should do them. And then we feel pretty hopeful. Like, okay, one off the, you know, the list. And if at noon, if I haven't, like, cussed out my coworker, that's another one I can put on the list. Like, man, I'm doing great. Didn't cuss that guy, you know, or whatever, you know, is going on in your life. But that's not what gives The author, Jeremiah of Lamentations, that's not what gives him hope, how good he is, and therefore he has hope of God's acceptance, being a good follower. He doesn't gauge it on that. Look at what it says again. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Mercy, by the way, is like God withholding what you justly deserve. You did cuss out the coworker, <laughs> and he goes, "Okay, not today. You deserve discipline, son, daughter, but I'm going to hold off. Why? Because of my steadfast love for you. It's unconditional. Doesn't matter how much you mess up. It's sacrificial. Just go look at the cross. What I've given you, my son. I love you. That's that's what he's talking about." This is where he gets his hope, not on his performance, but on the perfections of Christ and the depth, the boundless depth of his love for you. And then verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your, meaning your, my father, your faithfulness. This is how we gauge the way if we're accepted, if we've arrived, and the answer is yes. Yes and yes. Not because we're perfect, but because Christ is perfect. Now then, last Sunday, we looked at the three ways the gospel is to be proclaimed. And what we discovered was that the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone is shared through adversity. There's always repercussions if we're going to be faithful and share the gospel. And it's typically to the marginal, the least of these. And it is done in God's timing, which is any time, any place, anyone, anywhere, all that. And it calls sinners to do two things, repent of their sins and to believe in or trust in Christ for salvation. Now, moving forward this morning, we're going to look at the four attributes of a follower of Christ. And uh, to be honest, we're only going to look at like two and a half, okay? And so I apologize for that, but that's the way it goes. And my intent this morning is to enable you to follow Christ according to what we see in Scripture. Now, with that said, I want to make sure you know this, remind you of this. One, you're going to mess this up. We we all are. You're never going to follow him perfectly. But here's the second thing I want you to know, because you could just be satisfied with that. And go, okay, so, you know, I'm just going to live in sin and call myself a Christian. And many of us do that. That's not what I'm saying. The best of us, the most godly of us, and there are all variations on the theme. We are all in different places in our sanctification, but we are all the same in one way. We are justified fully and completely because of Christ, but as the Holy Spirit, God living in us, enables us. Sometimes some of us are living holier lives than others, and that's okay. It's not a competition. We've all won in Christ. But with that said, you know, it doesn't give you excuse to just go on living in sin. But here's the second thing I want you to know. 2 Timothy 2.13, look at what it says there. If we are unfaithful, and you are, I am, we are, we sin as believers. If we are unfaithful, look at what it says, he remains faithful and he cannot deny himself. His steadfast love renews every morning. 
just like we were told back in Lamentations. So much like the prodigal son, no matter how far you run, he'll still run out to embrace you. You are his son, you are his daughter, and he will remain faithful faithful to you even when you're unfaithful. So let's get to it and look at these attributes of a follower of Christ. Here's the first one. Jesus calls you to follow him, not the other way around. Jesus is the one that initiates this relationship, you following him, okay? So what I'm getting at here is that this relationship that we call Christianity is initiated and, in fact, must be initiated by God and not by us. Now, I know that sounds contrary to what many of us have been taught, perhaps even now believe, but the evidence is seen even here in our text. It's seen throughout Scripture, but we can find it here, too. So keep that in mind. Allow this question to guide you through this text. Here's the question. Who is initiating these relationships? Jesus and there's, you know, Simon and Andrew, the sons of Zebedee. Who's initiating these relationships? Look at verse 16 and 17. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he, meaning Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen, and Jesus said to them, you follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Who initiated that relationship? This is Jesus. Skip down to verse 19, 20. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who who were in their boat, mending the nets, and immediately he called them. Again, who initiated that relationship? It was Jesus every time. It's a real easy answer. And by the way, you can go throughout Scripture and you're going to find that same instance. So beginning in verse 17, what's he say to Andrew and Simon? By the way, Simon would later be known as the Apostle Peter. What does he say to initiate those relationships? Real simple, follow me or daiute. Daiute in Greek. And here's what you need to know about what Jesus or the way he was using that word. First of all, he wasn't asking them a question. Hey, if you've got nothing else to do, when you're done fishing, you want to go hang out with me. That's not what he was doing. Secondly, he wasn't even, and here's a key word, he wasn't inviting them to follow him in the sense of making a suggestion. It's up to you, but I highly recommend, you know, to follow me. When you're done fishing, Again, maybe you can come hang out with me. He didn't do either one of those. And this, unfortunately, this is the way that we have been brought up or inclined to believe the way Christianity works. It's an open invitation that we then have the choice to respond to, a personal invitation to your own personal Jesus Which then, by the way, even that language right there, when you talk about Jesus has become my personal Savior. The reason that language right there can lead to some awful sin is this. And I know you're going, wait a minute, he is my, he saved me personally. Yes, I get that. But often people will read into that and make it turn into this. Jesus is my personal Savior and now I can shape him and think about him and worship him in my own personal way. That is not defined or limited to Scripture or what comes out of the mouth of a preacher. I don't have to belong to a church and be accountable to brothers and sisters in Christ, even though the Bible says that I should do that. God himself says I should do that. Do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Bear one another's burdens in the context of church. I don't have to do any of that because he's my personal savior. See, there's a reason that that language is, one, missing from Scripture. Two, can be very erroneous, very wrong. It can lead us into idolatry, which is thinking and worshiping God in ways that are not found in Scripture. And that's why some of you are really confident and very comfortable with, I have my own personal Jesus. I don't need the Bible. I don't need you, preacher. I don't need the church. I don't need anything because he's my personal savior. But this is the way we look at Christianity and our own personal salvation. It's an invitation. It's a decision. It's up to you. 
Here's an example of this. You know, I've heard it in a lot of preaching. Typically during the altar call or the invitation, if you will, I, I've heard this little phrase used over and over again. Uh, the God has cast his vote. The devil has cast his vote for your soul. Now it's up to you to cast the deciding vote. You make the decision. Again, the word our Lord uses here is follow, daute. This is, the, this is the way he was presenting the gospel to these men. And that word in and of itself does not allow for those types of interpretations. He's not making a suggestion. He is not giving an invitation. He is not asking a question. Do you want to follow me or not? None of that. This is a command. The way this word would come across now in English would be like this. You and you, you're coming with me right now. Drop what you're doing right here, right now. This is the word that you would use to yell at your children who are running out into the street. Get over here right now. Mom, Dad, you've done this, yes? This is the word you use. You can use it now in Greek. I don't know how to spell it, do none of that. But you can yell up in that, and it's a command. You over here now. That's the way he was talking to these men. This is the way God summons us into salvation. You need to understand that. This is the same word Jesus used when he commanded Lazarus, who was dead and buried for four days, to come out of the tomb. Look at it, John 11, verse 43. Again, uh, his sisters were there, Lazarus' sisters. He had been dead already. They had already done the funeral. They had already put him in the clothes. They had put him in the tomb and put the stone over the top of it. And so here's what Jesus said. When he had said these things and they had rolled the stone out of the way, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Come here right now. Instantane. By the way, what could Lazarus do without that command? Just stink the place up, whatever. In fact, the sister said it's been four days. It's going to smell horrible if we open the thing, which I'm sure it did. But that was the whole point. To illustrate to us, not only to give him, you know, that he's risen and to perform that miracle proving that he was God. That's the primary reason, but also to illustrate for us what salvation looks like. Same word, Dayuta, you over here now. I'm commanding you. I have to speak to you this way because you can't even hear me. You are dead and buried, rotting in the tomb. Spiritually speaking, Simon and Andrew, James and John were in the same tomb. Spiritually speaking, you are in that same tomb, dead in your trespasses and sins. And so Christ speaks to us in that way. Not a suggestion, not an invitation, but a command. What he said to Lazarus that day was, you're no longer dead, come here, follow me now. There's another word we could look at in our text, or should, and it's verse, you see it in verses 19 and 20. Look at what it says there. Going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets, and immediately he called them. And so the Greek word for called is kaleo, and of course it has a range of meanings depending on the context. For instance, it can be used to describe the act of calling someone by a specific name. For instance, the time Jesus renamed Simon we find that in John chapter 1, verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John? You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And so he used that kaleo, that Greek word, to like, I'm going to change your name. This is what you're going to be known as from now on. It can also be used to invite someone to join you. We see this uh, example in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So you call somebody, hey, we want you to come hang out. We want you to come be a part of this wedding. Now then, in this context, back in our text, 
Kaleo means something quite different. Here it, refer, it refer, refers to the use of authority. The authority to someone, a person, uh, summon a person to appear before you. And so Jesus is there and he sees these two young men and they're working in their boats. Their dad's there. Those other guys are working there and they're mending the nets. And he says, hey, I want you to stop what you're doing. Stop mending nets for your dad. Drop what you're doing and get over here right now. You're following me from now on. And I'm sure Zebedee was like, you two idiots are really going to drop what you're doing and leave me here? And why would you do something like that? Here's the point. The biblical evidence is overwhelming. Jesus didn't ask. He didn't invite. He's not begging you or any of his followers to follow him. It isn't a request. It isn't a suggestion. This isn't something that is contingent on you making a decision or a choice in, that, in the way that you're thinking about it. A decision or a choice according to your preferences. No, what we have just seen, it proves that the call to follow Christ is a command that cannot be ignored or debated. You simply now of, if you will, your own freed volition, your now freed will, because when he calls you in the context of the gospel, when you finally hear the gospel and it sinks in from here to here and you understand I am a sinner and if I die in my sins, I'm going to spend an eternity in hell and my only hope is Jesus Christ and he is even now beckoning me to trust in him and not myself any longer for salvation. When that all lines up, Make sure you know this. God is calling you to Christ. Christ is calling you to follow him. He is calling you from hell to eternity in his Father's presence. He is saving you at that moment. That's what you need to understand. And now, because you were once previously spiritually dead, Ephesians 2, verse 1, he has made you alive, and by his love and his mercy and his grace, he has quickened you in the, old, in the uh, King James Version, brought you to spiritual life, and now of your own freed, past tense, because previously your will was enslaved to sin. You had a will. You made choices. You always chose to sin. But you'll say... Well, is that really true? I mean, that one time I walked a little old lady across the street. That was a good thing. I gave money. You know, I fed the poor. Yeah, all those things are socially acceptable things. But remember what I talked about in regards to love. What was your motive for doing those things? Typically, it's for the praise of men or to make up for something that you've done wrong prior or to gain the approval of God. See, you owe me now. Just like it says in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says on the day of judgment, there will be men, women, and children that will stand in front of him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do a bunch of things? And the question is, well, why did you do that? So that you can now stand in heaven with me? Or did you do it because you love me? Was it an act of faith? Or was it self-righteousness? Almost always selfish, therefore sinful. You see what I'm getting at? What we see here is now that you have a freed will from your past will that was enslaved to sin. And now you see your sins, you see hell, and you see your only hope is in Christ. And you will then choose Christ of your own freed volition, your own freed will. That's what happened to these men. That's what happened to you in the past. And for some of you, I pray, that's what will happen today, that you will be saved. So what we have seen proves that the call to follow Christ is a command that cannot be ignored or debated. You simply drop what you're doing. You are saved. You follow him. It's just like our Lord said in John 15, 16. These are his words, not mine. They really don't need any explanation. Look, look at it for yourself. Look at what he says. This is Jesus. You did not choose me. Stop, really? All of you, I know, most of us. 
Wait a minute, I made a choice. The preacher said I had to make a choice. It's all up to me. Now, who are you going to believe? Preacher or the Bible? Preachers can be wrong. I've been wrong many times. I'm going to be wrong today, probably. But right here, Jesus is just saying, I'm not, I'm not adding anything to this. Look at what he says. You did not choose me. How do you argue against that? I don't know. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And look, before you get all excited and start thinking, well, of course God chose me. Why wouldn't he? I'm such a good person. People like me. Blah, blah, blah. Self-righteous drivel, right? Bear in mind this. He didn't choose you to follow him because you're awesome and you're going to be a rock star preacher or something like that. God chose you because he can and he wanted to. It's as simple as that. He's God. He chose you not just to save you from your sins and eternal death, but to change you into his servant and for his glory. Knowing this to be true requires the God-given gifts of humility. I'm humbled by the fact that God said, come follow me. It requires that kind of humility and extraordinary faith, as we see in our second point. Following Christ requires faith. So what did these four men do when Jesus called, that is, commanded them to follow him? Now, of course, the Lord initiated these relationships, as we just saw. He, in fact, chose them, not the other way around. But that doesn't mean they were robots again. These are human beings, albeit sinful and spiritually dead, again, to, according to Ephesians 2.1. But still, he called them to follow him. And what did they do in response? What did Simon and Andrew do in verse 18? Immediately, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. How about James and John, verse 20? Look at what it says there. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So in both cases, the result was instantaneous. One moment, Simon and Andrew were fishing. James and John were mending nets alongside their dad. And then Jesus shows up, and everything changes in their lives. You know, to a certain degree, this speaks directly to what has happened or happens to you when you're saved. And it doesn't matter if you're seven, a seven-year-old sitting in the front pew of the church or if you're sitting in a jail cell reading a Bible. Jesus meets you where you're at. Because here's what all of us have in common. Again, regardless if you're just little or older or what have you, we're all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And not just any Savior, but the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one and only. So why would these men leave everything they've ever known behind in order to follow Christ? We're not told all the details, at least not here in our text, but we do see them elsewhere. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verses 1 and 3. Notice what it says there. And bear in mind that this is the same event that we're reading about in Mark. The only difference is Luke provides a little more insight into what's going on. And so look at verses 1 through 3, first of all. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God meaning Jesus, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to pull out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So there's a little more detail, right? He went out on, on Simon's boat. Everybody's gathered along the shore and they're hearing him preach. So our Lord was preaching the word and no doubt sharing the gospel because that's what he came for. So all four of these men heard him preaching to the crowd gathered alongside the shore. And that's an essential detail for you to remember. God has chosen to use the preaching of his word 
and the faithful proclamation of his gospel in order to save sinners and make disciples, followers of Christ. The word in the gospel, that's it. Everything else is, if you will, almost like fluff. Icing on the cake, it's all good. We have pews, we have air conditioning, we have you know, vaulted ceiling, moths everywhere, lizards coming under the door, all that. Right? Um, I had a lizard in my office, so it's fresh on my mind this week. It's terrifying. And uh, because I thought it was a snake. And so, in any case, all of that is icing on the cake. All that is needed for a follower of Christ, disciples to come together, is the word in the gospel. Don't worry about anything else. When you're praying and trying to honestly look, where should I sit down and call my spiritual home, what should be the vital things. Every time I have, I'm asked about this, it's always the same. And, and it doesn't even matter if, it's, if like, am I'm coming to church or I'm leaving the church. It's typically this. Well, we want to go someplace that has this really a cool youth group and a, you know, cool kids program because that's what we want and you know, trips and this and that. Or we're leaving because you guys do not have a cool youth group. You do not have a cool kids group. Whatever. You know, and I, I totally get it, what have you. My answer to them is always, go where the word is preached and the gospel is shared. Because where the word is preached faithfully and the gospel is proclaimed boldly, all those other things will eventually work themselves out. May not be perfect right here, right now, but because the word is the foundation, everything else has room to grow biblically, properly in God's timing. Let's do that. So in any case, this is where Jesus is starting. He's preaching the word. He's sharing the gospel. These four men hear this. So now we know he didn't just simply walk up to these four guys and say, hey, I know you don't know me, but abandon your careers, your families, and follow me. That's not exactly what happened. It's more along the lines of, here's the word. Let me make sure you understand it. Here's the gospel. Here's the only way you're ever going to be saved. In fact, I would dare say it was a big dose of law and grace. Old Testament preaching, because what else was he preaching, right? I mean, he is Jesus. He's the embodiment of the word. But he's preaching Old Testament texts that they would have been familiar with. He's expounding on those. He's explaining it to them. And it would have been a big dose of, uh, you know, do not lie. Do not commit adultery. I mean, he has a whole, the Sermon on the Mount is an exposition of basically the Ten Commandments. So he was giving them a big dose of the law, which would have done this. Dude, I'm horrible. I have no hope. I can never hope to be saved. Because this is what the law does to us. We had the opportunity yesterday to share gospel with a couple of, we, we're, we're horrible, me and Robert, because it was you, dude. <laughs> you and me. We had just cracked, forgive me, Mormon jokes, all right? And then he looked, he's like, dude, there they are. Let's go. <laughs> what am I going to do? Nah. <laughs> like, sure, let's go. So we go, and we start off with the question. Like, hey, do you think you're a good person? And the one guy stood back like he wanted to run away, but the guy from Cali was really engaged, right? And he's like, yeah, I'm a good person. It's like, all right. <laughs> so we dismantle that. Like, have you ever lied? Well, I think so. I was like, that's almost a lie, you know, is what I'm thinking. (laughs) So you're a liar. You know, we go through the thing, and he finally admitted this, that, and uh, Robert did a fantastic job praying for them, explaining how terms are different. They do not worship the same God, the same Jesus, have the same understanding of the gospel or salvation, and they left understanding that, like, you're not a Christian and we hope that you'll get saved because you just heard the, the gospel, the real gospel. And so in any case, 
the gospel, the word of God in the gospel, this is what Jesus was preaching. He preached the law, which brought about this deep conviction in people's hearts. That's the whole purpose of the law. The law was never intended for you to gauge, like, okay, I'm almost in. If I'm just good for a few more days before I die, I'm going to make it in. No, it doesn't work like that. Romans chapter 3, verse 19, 20, 21, those three verses, it basically it says this, the purpose of the law was to shut our mouths, our self-vindicating mouths. It stops us from going, God, I've done so much good. You owe me this. You owe me answered prayer. You owe me heaven. No, the law says you need to shut up. You're a sinner. You know it. You're a liar. You're a thief. You're an adulterer. You're a murderer at heart. You're all of these things. You've taken my name in vain. You've dishonored mom and dad. You're all of these. This isn't a gauge of how good you are. Now you get to brag about that and demand heaven. No, this is to shut your mouth. And then Paul, who wrote Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 20, he says, I would have never known what it was like to be a sinner unless the law had shown me. That's the purpose of the law. Jesus preached the word of God that day. He preached the law. And all of those people alongside the shore, the men in their boats, it would have left them speechless. I cannot justify myself before you, God. I'm not good enough. I deserve your judgment. I deserve hell. And then he would have given them a big dose of grace, which is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, I am a sinner. I am doomed to eternity in hell. But here is the gospel, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. He lived, the, lived out the law perfectly like none of us could ever do. He went to the cross eventually as he's preaching this, and he died with all of our sins on him. He died and then rose again from the grave. And it is by repentance, acknowledging you're a sinner and trusting in Jesus Christ that now his obedience, God counts that as being yours, justified before God. Now, when he died on the cross and said, it is finished, meaning the penalty has been paid in full, there's nothing less for you to do, God says, you are completely and fully forgiven of all your sins. Now you look at the tomb, it is empty, and you have eternal life to look forward to because you're looking at it with faith. You're trusting, just as he is risen, someday I too will be risen. This is God's grace. This is the gospel. This is the only way you can be saved. This is why these men abandoned their careers, even their families, and said, we've got to go. He preached the word. He shared the gospel. Law and grace. Let's read a little further in that same text. Luke chapter 5. Look at verses 4 through 8. And when he had finished speaking, preaching, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners on the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. The law had its effect. The preaching of the word had its effect. Some of you often, you know, tell me or even the other pastors that preach here, like, I always feel so beat up and convicted. And I'm thinking, as long as it's not just shamed or guilt, I'm good with that. Because it's not me, it's the word. Conviction is something that's healthy for us. Because it causes us to run to Christ. To run towards grace for relief. Not an excuse but for relief, and that's found only in Jesus. But he says this, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now then, this isn't just about hauling in the biggest catch of a lifetime. You know, miracle fishing expedition, and now I'm a follower of Christ. If we read into verses 9 and 10 in that same 
chapter, you would see that the catch astonished them, no doubt. And it was nothing less than a miraculous event that these seasoned fishermen witnessed. But when Simon, later known as the Apostle Peter, said those words, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What what he was saying was this, What is a holy one like you doing with a sinner like me? Forgive me, Lord. Be merciful. Withhold your judgment to me, a sinner. You know, catching a bunch of fish doesn't do that to you. But the word, the law, that brings conviction, and the gospel, God's grace, Jesus paid it all, that changes you. That causes you to drop everything and go, now I see where I'm going to spend eternity. I'm going to follow you. I'm changed. I am transformed. Verse 11 in Luke 5 sums it up like this. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Again, not because of fish, not because of miracles, not because of getting what they wanted, but because he gave them what they needed. Righteousness, forgiveness, eternal life. And you all know what happened here, right? On the part of the Apostle Peter, Simon and Andrew, James and John. Faith. The God-given gift of having the desire and the ability to trust in Christ for salvation. It took this kind of saving faith for the Apostle Peter and the other fishermen to literally drop their means of providing for themselves and their families all in order to follow Christ. It took faith in Christ for the sons of Zebedee, presumably young men, even teenagers, to tell their dad they weren't interested in the family fishing business anymore, but now we're going to follow Jesus. This is living proof of what Paul taught in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace, this this gift that you did not earn, you did not deserve, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is how you received that grace. This is how you receive Christ. Faith, which means I'm trusting in you, not myself. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, working really hard so that you can boast No, 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 your mouth is shut. Just like the Apostle Peter did, Simon did there. He's like, Lord, you got to go. What are you doing with a sinner like me? Forgive me, Lord. Some of you here this morning think that you have faith. And you would sum it up like this. I believe in God. That's all good and well, but according to James 2.19, the demons also believe and know that God exists, and they're going to spend an eternity in hell. That kind of knowledge is not enough to save you. That's not saving faith. Intellectual belief is not enough to save you from the coming judgment. You must have faith, saving faith, in Christ alone. You must trust in Him and not yourself or anything else. It takes This God-given gift of faith to abandon all that you know, especially your love for sin, those sins you cherish, that one sin that owns you and is even now whispering in your ear. You cannot, you will not forsake all for Christ until God in his sovereign grace gives you this gift. It's not something that you drum up like, oh, I'm going to really believe. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to control this. What did John, or rather Jesus, say to uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Nicodemus was this incredible teacher of the law. And he, you know, he had a question for him and he told him, like, look, you don't even get to see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Unless the Holy Spirit causes you to be born again. This is something that you do not get to control. It is either gifted to you or it is not. You will not forsake everything like these men did for Christ until God in his sovereign grace 
gives you faith. And until that moment, make no mistake, regardless of how good you think your life is, you are like the first-class passengers on the Titanic, dressed in tuxedos, sipping fine wine, all the while on a sinking ship, submerging into the depths. Without faith, you're on a sinking ship, and hell awaits. Some of you profess to follow Christ, and yet you live sin-filled lives. <coughs> and all of us sin, I get that, but some of us are habitually, publicly, knowingly, no desire to repent. You're justifying your sin. You're twisting Scripture so that it fits that sin of yours. You profess to follow Christ. You live in these sin defeated and resolved to never gain victory of that ongoing sin in your life. In a word, you are for all intents and purposes faithless. And I get it, and more importantly, your father, he gets it. Again, I go back to 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now, that doesn't mean you get to take Scripture and say, you know what? Scripture doesn't say I shouldn't do this kind of sin. I'm going to twist it. It doesn't apply there. It means when you at times sin, and we all do, and you're unfaithful, he's going to remain faithful. But when you go so far in your sinful rebellion, you're professing Christ, and as so many people are doing now, and you're living in sin constantly that is black and white in scripture and you're twisting it to justify your ends then you should really question am I a believer or not all of us myself included need to cry out much like our father cried out a father cried out to Jesus on behalf of his ill son he did this, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Now then, as we wrap this up, I have two questions. We've learned that Jesus is the one that calls or commands you to follow him. So here's the first question. How do I know if Christ has called me? By the way, just like the Apostle Peter and the other fishermen on the Sea of Galilee that day, the calling of Christ to follow him is always heard in the preaching of the word and the gospel. So again, if you hear the gospel and you hear who Jesus is, what he has done, you hear the call to repent and believe, to trust, to have faith in him, and you really feel that, that is Jesus calling you. If you really feel the weight of your sin, if you truly feel and fear an eternity in hell, and you truly feel that your only hope is Jesus Christ, that is God calling you, come here now. And now you are spiritually awakened. You are spiritually alive. Your will is freed from its bondage to sin. And now you can, just like they did, they immediately followed him. You immediately follow Christ. You repent of your sins this morning and you trust in Jesus Christ right here and right now. You don't need a preacher to do that for you. You don't need a sinner's prayer. You need the gospel. And I have just shared that with you as faithfully as I can. And some of you even now need to stop listening to me, bow your heads, repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ and be saved this morning if you hear the gospel and you feel those things that is Jesus saying follow me right here right now second question how do I follow Christ again repent trust in Christ not later right now be saved become a follower of Christ now then lastly the the uh, two and a half points. Here's the third kind of summary. Verse 17. How, how is it that you're transformed? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? How can you tell that you've indeed repented and trusted in Christ? There's various ways to gain assurance of your salvation, but here's what Jesus offers right here in verse 17 of our text. Follow me, and notice what he says, I will make you fishers of men. 
will make you. In other words, this is going to be a process. You are going to be changed. You're going to be transformed in the way that you live your life. And that's true in everything. You'll become more forgiving. You'll become more Christ-like. You'll become more prayerful. You'll become more faithful in reading Scripture. You'll become a part of a church. All of those things are true. But he points to one primary thing. I will make you fishers of men. In other words, you're going to go and do what I just did, which is to share the word, proclaim the gospel faithfully. Forget everything else, and let's exclude it to that one thing. Do you really have assurance that you're following Christ based solely on your faithfulness in sharing the gospel with your lost family, your lost friends, co-workers, perfect strangers? Do you have that evidence? Like, you're asking, how do I know if I'm following Christ? Jesus gave the answers. You're going to grow in your ability and desire to go and fish for men. In other words, to go share the gospel. Are you or are you not doing that? Because according to what Jesus just said, that's the primary way of knowing, am I following you, Jesus? Are you sharing the gospel would be his question to you. So are we or not? Are you following Christ or not? I know I need to grow in my following him in that way, as I'm sure all of us need to. So as we end here this morning, and we prepare ourselves, as they come up, our team's going to come up, and we prepare ourselves for communion, here's how I challenge you to pray. Lord, help me follow you. Not the way I choose to, but help me follow you into becoming a fisher of men, being faithful to proclaim the gospel. That one area, more than anything else, help me follow you. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for calling us to follow you because without that calling, we, we would have just remained dead in the tomb. We thank you, Father, that you have indeed changed us, transformed our lives. You've put in us the desire to, to share gospel. I know all of us have done that from time to time. I, I, I have no doubt about that. But Lord, help us to follow you even closer in that regard. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters to that end, that they would grow in their love for you, in the way that they follow you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As our team prepares to lead us in a time of, of worship and preparation for communion, make that your prayer. Father, help me follow you to become fishers of men. And we see the evidence in the elements. This is all we're really talking about. This is the gospel. Jesus Christ offering himself up to be our righteousness, our sacrifice, our guarantee of eternal life. His perfect obedience, the cross, and the empty tomb. And we see that as we come. As you prayerfully repent of your sins this morning and prepare for communion, keep those things in mind.